our Bibles tonight, and let's open to Revelation chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Revelation 4, beginning in verse 1, uh, the message is called A View into Heaven. We get a glimpse into the throne room of the living God in Revelation chapter 4. Let's ask God's blessing and, and uh, look to his word. Father, we, we know that you show us through your word, you show us your heart. And so God, tonight, that's our, that's our desire. We want to just, we want to know your heart. And so let your word just speak life. And thank you for this, this revealing of Jesus Christ in the latter days. So Lord, we just, we want to understand the things, the signs of the times that we might be a people made ready for the Lord. And so we love you and thank you in Jesus name. Amen. You know, a lot of people wonder like, what is heaven like? And, and I think... Of course, movies, uh, you know, things, uh, all kinds of ideas, you know. Some people think, well, you know, heaven is like they take things of the earth and then they just like make them better. And that's the idea of, of heaven, right? It's go to a place where, you know, they, there's amazing golf courses, <laughs> you know, like that. Or, or you know, like the, the, there's the, the lakes are like pristine and the fishing is great, you know, things like that. Or uh, we're going to be feasting and banqueting and it's going to be amazing food and we're never going to get fat, you know, kind of like that. Uh, but see, here's the thing. I, I think all of that, uh, honestly, I think all of it, it doesn't even touch it. It doesn't even touch it. Because I think that when, when you look at just the glimpse that God gives us of heaven, like it puts the things of the earth, I mean, you don't just take the things of the earth to magnify them because that doesn't touch it, right? I mean, it, it doesn't, words cannot even capture it. I mean, words can't capture it. And so he's given this vision and he tries to put it in these words, but it just can't capture it, which just makes you just have this longing. I think in me, there's this longing. And here's one of the other things I've come to really appreciate about uh, the perspective of eternity of heaven, that it's really not about whether there's golf courses there or lakes there or anything like that. The whole thing is God is there. Right, and you're going to have a relationship of nearness to your God that that is just absolutely astounding and amazing. Words can I can use words like amazing, and that doesn't do it. It's awesome. Well, that doesn't do it. We just there's no words. There are no words that can capture. But it's about that relationship, and I'm also convinced that part of it also is the relationship that we have with our loved ones, and and I look forward to that. I look forward to that. Many, many of you know we, we lost our daughter uh, three years ago. And, and I had this, uh, for the longest time, I didn't have any dreams uh, of her. But then I had this dream. Vivid, vivid, vivid dream. And, and uh, so in, in my dream, like she, she came to me in my dream. And she had this radiant smile. Whenever she was like super like happy, like just overflowing with happiness, she had this radiant smile and, and she had this radiant smile on her face. And she was, she was just saying, dad, I'm okay. I, I'm doing well. And I don't know about you, it just, I don't know, it just blessed my heart. I can't, that doesn't even put it into the right words, but it was just, I woke up with such peace that I, I know that. I know that my Redeemer lives, and I know that I will see my daughter again. Amen. And there, there is this hope. There is this hope that we have. Heaven is about the relationships, first and foremost, with God. And the intimacy that we have is amazing. So he gives us this, this image of it in Revelation 4. John is taken up to heaven, and so he's instructed to write what he sees. But no words are adequate, right? So... You read these, these words and frankly, it just makes you yearn for more. And the, Revelation 4 is really just the, the tip of the iceberg, you might say, in the sense that there's going to be so much more that comes out of this story, so much more that comes out of the scene at the throne room of heaven. So we're brought by John right into, this, into the throne room of God. Because John is about to reveal to us the events of the, of the latter days, the future things. 
but he starts with, builds this foundation of the throne of heaven. And we're brought into this scene by John. Oh, if we could only see what his eyes saw, I'm telling you what, it would be glorious. But we, we have to then rely on this description, relying on these words. And you know, it reminds me of a phrase I heard a long time ago, uh, that we are changed in the presence of a holy God. And, and you see this, 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 this image of the throne room of God and the holiness is like the theme of the whole thing. It's like the holiness of God just emanates from the throne. And so that we are changed in the presence of a holy God. Hey, when we tonight, here in this place, we gathered and, and the, the presence of the Lord was here. And the Holy Spirit was here and we are changed in the presence of the living God. Can you just imagine being in the, in the place of the throne room of God? What, what it would do for us. So he describes this scene. He says there's this throne standing in heaven. Uh, there's one sitting on the throne, radiant in glory. And uh, he describes what that looks like best that he can. We're going to get into more of the actual specific details on Wednesday. But he tells us that around the throne are 24 thrones. Now, why 24 thrones? Here, we'll look at that on Wednesday. And he says, upon the throne, uh, there are 24 elders sitting, clothed with white and golden crowns on their heads. But also, I mean, I, I think we could look at that and like, okay, we would expect that. I mean, that, that sounds like something we would expect to see, right? These 24 elders, we can kind of understand who they might be or, or what positions they would hold. White garments, we understand. Uh, sitting on thrones under his throne, uh, the golden crowns, we, we would almost imagine something like that. But then he surprises us by telling us, oh, and by the way, there are these creatures, these living uh, creatures that are there, angels. And, and the, the description of these is, is beyond description. And these four living creatures, which are before the throne, never cease in, to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. In other words, they, they say it, and then they say it, and then they say it, and then they say it. it they, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Uh, there's just this, this declaration that just emanates as they're before the throne, these four living creatures. Holy, holy, holy. Well, holiness, as we know, is like one of the main aspects of the character of God. And, and in fact, he tells us that is something that he wants to see in us. His holiness in us is how we are transformed in this life. That's what he is doing in us. His presence brings about transformation. He's in the process of changing us from the mess that he found us in into his image and he is moving us out of the world into more and more holiness. That is the change, the transformation that God is doing in our lives. Our job is to say, we, we want to cooperate. Lord, it's your work in us. Have your way. Transform us. Make us more like yourself. That's the transformation he is doing in all of us. He's making us like himself. And in fact, when you look at these four living creatures, in, in many ways, they, they like represent the nature and character of God. They're like a reflection. So remember that, that glory emanates from the throne. And he talks about the radiance of that. We'll look at here tonight. But it emanates. And then those who then are before the throne have that glory upon them. And that glory upon them is his nature, his character then uh, upon the life. And so these four living creatures, like they are the, the, the embodiment or the, the reflection even of his, of his character, his holiness, his being. And uh, they're nothing like anything we can imagine. And they represent Jesus Christ. Now, when you read through the prophet Ezekiel, there's, there's many... Uh, last day's prophecies in Ezekiel, you might know that, and Daniel and others, Zechariah. And, but in Ezekiel, we get this uh, a similar, somewhat different, but similar view of the throne of God. And uh, there are these living creatures. And so he describes, in, in, there's a lot of similarities here, and the, the Jewish rabbis, 
who've, who've looked at these and, you know, sort of tried to bring interpretation to their meaning, they believe these are the greatest of God's creation and they represented the, the standard or the ensign, you know, like the flags, you might say, of the four tribes, uh, the standard of the four leading tribes that surrounded the temple or the tabernacle in the desert. As you know, Israel traveled, traveled to the desert with the tabernacle in the center. And the uh, three tribes on the north, three in the south, three in the east, and each of them had kind of a lead tribe and they would have an ensign or a standard on this flag. So they believed that these represented those. Um, Others also add the belief that they are a great reflection of each of the Gospels, as we're going to look at that also. And so let's read it, Revelation chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. After these things, I looked, and behold, there was a door standing open in heaven. Now that right there is an amazing thought. Jesus says, I am the door. I am the open door. That's just an interesting view. And the first voice which I heard, it was like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. So it's going to be a prophetic view. Now immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow um, around the throne, although it was emerald. So it wasn't like what we would think of a multicolored rainbow. Uh, more like an arch that was emerald in color. They're doing their best to describe it. And around the throne were the 24 elders. And upon the thrones, I saw 24 elders. Uh, elders sitting, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their, on their heads. And from the throne there proceeded flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. We're going to look at that on Wednesday. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. That, that is a, a, just an amazing thing to ponder, to consider what that might even look like, a sea of glass, like crystal. Just amazing to consider. And in the center, okay, in the sea of glass, like crystal, in the center, there was, that was where the throne was. And then it says, and there were four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. I mean, all you can say is, wow, like what is that? Nothing like we can imagine. And nothing, nothing what we, we, can, we can even conjure in our minds very well. It's like we have, no, we have no way to kind of put that in our minds. And these four living creatures, each one of them had six wings full of eyes around and within, and day and night, they did not cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Now, when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever, and they will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy art thou, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and they were created. All right, now, having seen this, Let's go back and add a little more, more dimension. Let's add a little more to these because I, 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 I skipped over this one so that we can focus on it. Notice it says in verse 7 that the first creature was like a lion. A first creature had the appearance of a lion. And the second was like a calf or an ox or a bull. And the third had the face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was that like of a flying eagle. 
And I want us to really look at these four living creatures because they're, they're amazing to our understanding. What they represent is something that we should really take hold of. And we start with this one who says that he, he had the appearance of a lion. And this is a reflection, of course, of the glory of God, the character of God, the, the, the nature of God. Now, Jesus is called the lion from the tribe of Judah. So I think we can immediately like, understand that one. Like that is an image that we can like, we would expect that. But yes, he's reflecting the heart of the Lord and he is reflecting, remember now, that the nature of God, the heart of the Lord, is something that he wants to see in us. So you think of these aspects of God's nature and they really must be then looked at and applied in a personal way. So he, maybe, for example, we can look at this one and say, therefore God wants us to have also the heart of a lion. Have a heart of a lion. The qualities of a lion are, are very clear, right? Power, uh, authority, um, strength, boldness, right? The heart of a lion. We can grasp that really well. And these majestic symbols, right, represent the nature of God, the character of Jesus, God's heart after us, his nature in us. So let's look, let's apply those things. What does it mean to have like the heart of a lion? Well, there's, a, there's the authority and power. That's the, you know, it's like the greatest of the beasts, you know, the, the authority and power. He's the lion from the tribe of Judah. Right, so immediately you think, well, authority and boldness, right? Authority requires like this boldness. Authority is sometimes seen like a key. Jesus refers to this also in Revelation 1, verses 17 to 18, when he speaks of the authority like a key. If you have the key to the house, you have authority, right, to enter the house. That's like the authority. And Jesus said in Revelation 1, do not be afraid. I'm the first, I'm the last, I'm the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and I have the keys of hell. I don't know about you, but there's something like pretty powerful description there. He's like, he's the one who opens the door, right? He's got the keys to death. I am the resurrection and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. But if you come to the Father but by me, you have life everlasting because you have the resurrected life that I purchased for you and I opened the doors to death because I overcame death by my power. And I have the keys to hell, by the way. And you think, you know, in many modern uh, pictures of hell, you know, we think that, that Satan is the captain of hell. Let me just reassure you who holds the keys to hell, okay? <laughs> Amen. And then remember also when Peter, this is talking about the authority of the church. Uh, Peter said, or Jesus said to Peter, on this rock, right after Peter just uh, declared, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And what a testimony. Who do the people say I am? They say this, but who do you say I am? Peter responded, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, that, that is a declaration of victory and authority. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is just something powerful to understand. All authority has been given to Jesus, he said. And he promised to be with us. He who has the keys of death and the keys of hell, he who has all authority, he says, I will be with you. I am in you. I will be with you even to the end of the age, right? Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go! That's why, I mean, I'm calling you, go, make a difference in this world, go, therefore, and, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, which is why we baptize, right? Jo he told us, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you, I am with you, always, even to the end of the age. I love that promise right there. He's with me even to the end of the age. He's with you. 2 Corinthians 3, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech. You know why you use great boldness? You know when you're like speaking spiritual things or talking about spiritual things? You have boldness. 
right? Because you know that the authority of God's gospel is powerful, right? And so here's another example. Okay, after the resurrection, this is, I love this story. After the resurrection, there's this great revival that breaks out in Jerusalem, right? And so the Jewish leaders, very concerned about this, they have Peter and the others arrested, only to have an angel appear at night, open the doors of the, of the prison, and they, they get out of the prison and immediately go down to the temple and start teaching again. And so the, the, the Jewish leaders are told, they're not in the prison, they're out there teaching. So they have them seized and arrested, and they brought them before the council. Like, we thought, didn't we tell you to stop doing this? And they responded, we will obey God, not men. Right? They, they spoke immediately with this authority. We will obey God and not men. And they, were, they, were, they didn't know what to do. Right? They were considered stoning them. They were considered to kill them. And a Gamaliel, one of the Jewish leaders, corrected them. But listen to what he said. Acts chapter 5, Gamaliel says, Look, if what these men are doing should be of men, it will come to nothing. It will be overthrown. But... If what these men are doing is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. Or else you may even be found fighting against God. Do you believe that God is with you? Do you believe that God is for you? See, that to me is a tremendous understanding. Because if you have that understanding, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. All authority has been given to me. Have that understanding. It is a tremendous difference in the believer who knows that, who stands by that. In all humility, understands what God is doing in calling us to have the heart of a lion. Now, having said that, we should also understand this, that godly authority requires full commitment. I mean, he's calling us to be all in, right? He's not asking us to just kind of, well, I'm not sure. I might kind of think. He says, no, wait a minute. Don't be lukewarm here. I want you all in, right? Make your decision. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And if you're going to serve the Lord, I say serve him with all your God. Serve him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? He's, he says, look, at, there's a time to take a stand, See, there's a, that's the point. There's a time to stick, uh, take a stand. There's a time to have no compromise. Jesus repeatedly said to the churches, he who overcomes. What does it mean, he who overcomes? It means to hold fast. It means that you are holding with a firmness and a boldness. You keep his word until the end. Um, I, I'll, I have this image in my mind when I think about this. I think about um, this, this, this image that I saw on an LP album. Okay, do you know what LP albums are? Yeah. Okay, this was before cassette players. Okay, this was before eight tracks. And a lot of people don't even know what those are. But they had these LPs, long play albums, and uh, they were like, you know, this big. And the big part about them, not just the music, but that's a lot of space to put some like awesome album covers. And so Keith Green was one of my artists that I loved when I was young. He wrote an album called No Compromise. And this is the cover of it. Of it. It's a picture of Nebuchadnezzar. Everyone's bowing down, but one meek soul. I love this image. I used to just stare at this image for such a long time. That there's one meek soul who's standing. And if you make it out, there's one right next to him, like trying to pull him down. What are you thinking? But he just stands there meek and powerful. He will not bow. He will not compromise. Even if it costs him his life, he will not bow. He will not compromise. I, there's just something about that that we need to grasp because frankly, we are living in days where that is becoming more and more of a necessity. Because this culture and this society in which we are living is more and more, there is further and further away from God means that they are more and more against the church. Do you sense that? Do you see that what's happening in our culture and in our society right now? The farther the society gets away from God, the more they are against the church. 
You got to know when to take a stand, right? Now, going back to Revelation chapter 4, as you look at these, uh, these next animals, serve with the power of an ox. The, the ox is like the most powerful of the beasts of burden, but it is a beast of burden. In other words, it's, a, it's like it represents the heart of serving. The heart of the Lord is, in fact, serving. It is the character of God revealed. And Jesus himself was the very example of that. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, even though he's the son of the living God. He's king of kings and lord of lords. I didn't come to be served. So he, he says it this way. He says, he who desires to be first, let him be the last. You want a principle of the kingdom of God? He who desires to be first, let him be the last. He who desires to be the greatest, let him be the least and the servant of all. And then he uses himself as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, in the Old Testament, many of the sacrifices were that of a bull. And all of the Old Testament sacrifices pointed to Jesus Christ as the one who would lay down his life. I've come to give my life as a ransom for many. And you see this in this, this image of this beast, this living creature rather, who's a reflection of the heart of God, that of a servant. It's really a powerful image. And that you look at the character of like that ox, right? You get so many things you can apply that be steady, be faithful. You know, an ox has that, that steadfastness. If a, if a farmer had to plow a difficult ground, you know, full of rocks, or it was very hard, the animal of choice is the ox, right? Because it's powerful, you know, mighty powerful, sure-footed, you know, steady. And there's a lot of scriptures that speak to that in our lives. 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable. I love that. Always abounding in the work of the Lord in your life. Always abound in the work of the Lord in your life, knowing that your toil is not in vain. It's not in vain in the Lord. You be steadfast. You be steadfast and movable. One of the qualities of, the, of an ox, right, is that, is that he does the work without complaining. An ox, generally speaking, does not have an attitude. There's a lot for us to learn here. In contrast to like a donkey, which is sometimes going by a different name, <laughs> that oftentimes has an attitude. And that, you know, in order to get him to go in the direction you want him to go, sometimes you have to use a two by four. But you know, the ox, the, the, the bull, the ox, actually, many people are not aware that they were, they were extremely trainable, quite compliant. To the point that the, the farmer could, could, could walk behind them and simply give verbal direction. And the, and the ox would just move according to the direction simply spoken. And no attitude. It's like, what a great quality. You know when Jesus, an example, when Jesus visited the home of the two sisters, Martha and Mary... You remember this story, right? Martha is making preparations for dinner, but she starts complaining. And she's complaining because her sister Mary is not helping with the preparations. And so, interestingly, she actually confronts Jesus. Can you imagine this? She does. She confronts Jesus over this. And she says, Lord, do you not care that that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Tell her to help me. And as we know the story, the Lord doesn't tell Mary to help her. Instead, corrects Martha. But his correction is, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. Now, he's not correcting her for preparing the dinner. He's not correcting her for, you know, serving in the kitchen. Hey, someone's going to have to put together dinner. That's not the problem. The problem is the attitude. Martha, Martha, you are worried and you are bothered about so many things. But Mary has chosen the better part and it will not be taken from her. 
And then you see this perspective of that, that character of this, of this living creature and, and that which is the ox. And you can apply that maybe in another way. You can say, like, do the difficult things. In every house, in every ministry, there are jobs no one wants to do. Those with servant hearts, like they're willing to do the difficult things. That's like that's the ox, right? Can do the difficult things. You you got a field that's got rocks in it. You want the ox. You got a you got a field that's like hard. Yeah, you need the ox. And so there's that perspective of those that have that heart toward the Lord. They'll do the difficult things. They'll do the hard things. I mean, hey, dealing with our sins couldn't have been easy. Dealing with people like us can't be easy. I remember when we had our first baby and, uh, you know, I was like, I was like so into it. Hey, we're, my wife's pregnant, you know, and I went to all the doctor's appointments and, and like, I'm into this, you know, and, and, uh, I'm the coach, you know, the birthing coach. And, and I was like into it. I mean, I got, I got, I, I studied, I did all this stuff. I was all ready for it, you know, got my cheering all down. I knew how to cheer, you know push him out, push him out, way out. And I get it all, you know, he's like, I'm, I'm going to do my coaching, right? And I got me in, I'm in, I'm totally in. <laughs> and uh, she almost bit me in the shoulder for that one. Uh, but, you know, after, after the baby's like, okay, I'm in, right? Well, uh, some tasks are unpleasant, let's say. But like, okay, okay, I'm in, I'm still in. Okay, I'm still in, I'm still doing this, I'm in. Until one day she decided, for whatever reason, that she wanted to try cloth diapers. Exactly. Now there's a limit here, people, and we just hit it. And then, and then she says, she says, oh, she got me with this one. She says, you know, you are so kind. You help with so many things, but you've never, ever rinsed out the diapers. <clears throat> Next thing you know, I'm like diaper rinse king. <laughs> I'm still in counseling over that. <laughs> but see, my, my, my point is like when we get closer to the days, when we get closer to the latter days, the heart of a servant is going to actually be very spiritually valuable. Here's why. The scripture describes that the Antichrist will arise on the scene and he will, by all appearances, do what no man has been able to do. He can solve the unsolvable, like bring peace to the Middle East, for example, which he will do. And then, but it also describes like the, the turmoil that the earth will be in. He seems to be able to bring the solutions which suggests that troublesome times will arise, which leads the way to the arising of the Antichrist. And therefore, those troublesome times, and frankly, as we look at what's happening in the world today, we can sense that there's an evil rising. We can sense that there is something stirring. Anyone with any kind of spiritual discernment can sense it. There is something rising right now in the earth. And there is a, like a, a storm cloud, there is like a, a, a looming evil. And therefore, difficult times are going to come. Difficult times will come. And those who have a heart to serve, those who have a heart to serve will be, become like a necessity. Now, let's go back to Revelation 4, because he speaks to these last ones. And God desires both humility and greatness, which is what we see in these last creatures. These living creatures before the throne. Interestingly, they are like the closest. They're even closer than the 24 elders. They're like the closest to the throne, the presence of God, and they never cease in their humility to give him glory, to give him honor. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Then you look at these 24 elders sitting on their thrones. Okay, they're sitting on thrones, which, which speaks to the fact that they have authority, right? They've got crowns, golden crowns, they, they, they're positions of authority and power. But what does it say that they do? They cast their crowns before the throne of the, of, the, of the one who sits on the throne. And you see this perspective in both the humility and the greatness. Both. Both. Humility and greatness. You say, well, humility. 
Yeah, you look at the, this, the face of the man, I'm convinced, represents humility. The one with the face of a man. He said, well, how do you say that? How do you see it? Here's why I see it. Because when Jesus, the scripture tells us that when Jesus became a man, he was with his father in glory. But when he became a man, when he became a bond servant, it was an act of greatest humility. Does God have humility? Absolutely. Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 to 8. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And then being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself even further by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The example of God's heart in humility is seen in Jesus Christ himself. Then it tells us that glory and honor, actually, the glory and honor are given to those who understand the value of humility. It is a quality of God's heart. And those who understand it, because it does take some depth of understanding. Many people do not understand what humility is. And it takes some depth of understanding to grasp what real true humility is. But those who grasp it and understand it, glory and honor are given to them. Like you see in this, this contrast between these, these elders sitting on thrones, having crowns, but they cast their crowns before the throne of God. They understand humility. In Matthew 23, the greatest among you, he said a similar thing, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself is going to be humbled. And God will see to it. That's the point. God will see to it. But whoever humbles himself will be exalted and God will see to it. There's an aspect of faith there. And then lastly, this last creature, the, the, the image of an eagle, right? The eagle is the majesty of God. The, the, it's a reflection of God's heart, right? And it's a, this fourth living creature, like a flying eagle even. The symbol, his, his wings are spread, in other words. There's something very powerful, especially like a bald eagle, right? It's a, it's a great symbol for the United States. Uh, a lot to say on that. Maybe we'll get to it Wednesday. But there's this image of this bald eagle. I mean, this eagle, grandiose, right? Uh, uh, majestic power. But flying at the heights, flying at these heights, it's a symbol of power and majesty of God, right? Uh, Psalm 91, uh, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, I, I just, I want to stop there because I love that verse. I mean, I can, just, I can just say that verse over and over and over because of what it says. It's so powerful, right? He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And then he adds to it in verse four. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you may seek refuge his faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. It's his heart. It shows us his character, his nature. And this is, that's why it's giving him glory. The eagle, you know, is the only animal. Did you know the only animal that can actually look directly at the sun and not damage its eyes? Is it, what a picture, right? Because light is a, is a, is a picture of glory. And, and the picture of, of Jesus who can who perceive the Father in all his glory. Do you remember when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration and was transfigured in glory? It's just a beautiful picture. It's majestic. It's soaring high. Lift, you know, by the great wind. It's a picture of the Holy Spirit. Who is, who, the, the, the word spirit in Greek actually means wind. The Holy Wind. It's a powerful perspective when you see them together. And then, and then when you understand that how he applies that to our lives, the strength of the eagle, the power of the eagle is actually applied to us. In Isaiah 40, you get one of the most powerful images of it 
In Isaiah 40, and I think I've got just one verse in your notes, but I want to read more. It says in verse 29 of Isaiah 40, he gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. The young men, youths grow weary and tired. Vigorous young men will stumble badly. But those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired and they will walk and not faint. I don't know about you, but I love that picture. And he's giving that to us to understand, wait a minute, that's God's nature. That's God's character. And those who draw near, those who draw near will have the abundance of God's nature seen in their lives. Are you weary? Tired? Beat up? This world will beat you up. Wear you down. There's so much against you in this world. This, world, this life is a struggle. Anybody see it? This life is a struggle. It'll beat you up. It'll beat you down. But Jesus said, come unto me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest for your souls. And here, in Isaiah 40, he gives strength to the weary. Those who lack might, he increases power. Even young men will stumble badly. Yet those who wait for the Lord will rise up with wings like eagles. You've been beaten down? He will will lift you up. He will strengthen your soul. Draw near. The presence of the Lord is the key to the understanding. You draw near to the Lord and it is his nature and his character that will transform you. Let's pray. Father, we are so blessed Because your word is your heart revealed and you pour forth your word in revealing what the throne of the living God is like. And these four living creatures who reflect your glory and your eminence and your power, reflect your character. And it is in us that you desire that it be seen. And I pray, Lord, for everyone in this room tonight that we would desire to be transformed in the presence of the living God. Church tonight, would you even say to the Lord, I, I see this, this image, this picture of heaven and this throne, and it makes, makes me desire the presence of God in my life. It makes me desire, I want the presence of God, because that is the power of God manifested. He gives strength to the weary. Church tonight, if you're beat up, if you're wearied down, if if this world is just knocking you over, then rise up in the presence of the living God. You will be strengthened in your soul. You will rise up with wings like eagles and he'll strengthen your soul. Is that your desire? Would you invite God to move on your life? Would you just raise your hand and say it to the Lord? God, I'm inviting you to move on my life. I'm inviting, I want to see those, those things in my life as well. God, you're the one who gives strength to the weary. You're the one who causes us to rise up. God, we, God, we want to rise up with wings like eagles. We want to stand before the presence of the living God, strengthened in power because you're the one who strengthens us. And we give you praise for all you're doing. In Jesus' name, and everyone say,